Hey there, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. Before we get into today's show, I have an incredibly important announcement. This is something that I really haven't been more excited to announce than all the way back in 2014 when I first started the Energy Blueprint. After well over a year of development and testing, we are finally ready to officially launch our breakthrough mitochondrial supplement to the world. This is a genuine game changer in the area of human energy enhancement, and it's called Energenesis. This is actually the first no stimulant, no caffeine, and no sugar energy formula that actually builds up your own body's capacity to produce energy. Instead of working like caffeine and stimulants by giving you a temporary boost of energy for a few hours, but ultimately making your energy levels worse over time, Energenesis actually builds up your own body's ability, your cellular capacity to produce energy. Energenesis got over 20 amazing, powerful ingredients at real effective doses. This is a premium formula that uses actual real effective doses. So this is literally like 23 supplements all in one. And with that in mind, just to mention a few testimonials that people have wrote in after using Energenesis. So this one's from Barbara. She said, I'm a 72 year old female and I love, love, love Energenesis. I have more sustained energy through the day and I'm actually getting my life back. I'm doing things that I haven't been able to do for 10 years. Anya, she said, I really love that it gives me just the right kind of steady and balanced energy. Unlike stimulants, which I can't tolerate, Energenesis gives me a perfect smooth kind of energy that lasts throughout the whole day. Michelle Catlin, this is one of my favorite ones. She said, um, Ari, are you getting tired of all the praise and requests for Energenesis yet? I'm on my third bottle and I have to tell you, I haven't felt this good in years. So if you've been struggling with your energy levels and you're looking to get this area of your life handled, and not just to get a temporary boost of energy for a few hours, but to actually transform your energy levels by building real energy at the cellular level, then go get yourself some Energenesis. You can get it at theenergyblueprint.com forward slash Energenesis. So go to that page, check out all the ingredients and all the science behind it, how it works. It's all there. There's about 200 scientific references behind all of the different ingredients in Energenesis. They're all listed on that page along with a lot of the science behind the ingredients. There's also a video explaining it all. Check it all out. Check out the science, then grab yourself some Energenesis and let's get started. I know that you are going to be blown away by the result. The URL is theenergyblueprint.com forward slash Energenesis. And now let's get into the episode. Hey there, this is Ari. Welcome back to the show. In this episode, I'm talking with Dr. Katherine Clinton on the link between stress, the gut microbiome, and your energy levels. Enjoy the episode. Hey there, welcome back everyone. Right now, I have with me Dr. Katherine Clinton, who is a Licensed naturopathic physician with a focus on gut health, autoimmunity, and psychoneuroimmunology. When in medical school, Catherine was diagnosed with and healed from an autoimmune disease that affects the gastrointestinal tract, leaving her with a special interest in autoimmune diseases and how the gut microbiome impacts immune and overall health. With the birth of her own children, Catherine became really passionate about the prevention of these chronic diseases and conditions by addressing the psychoneuroimmune system and the gut health of children. She has multiple peer-reviewed medical journal publications, and she writes for several other publications. So welcome, Dr. Clinton. Such a pleasure to have you. And I am super excited to get into this talk on psychoneuroimmunology and gut health and mitochondrial health and how those tie together to optimize our energy levels. Well, thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here. This is my favorite topic. So Beautiful. let's get started. Yeah. yeah. So I guess first, let's just do a broad overview. Uh, give me the kind of the big picture of what psychoneuroimmunology is and how that relates to the mitochondria and the microbiome. Absolutely. Well, they create kind of an intersection, so to speak. So the mitochondrial health is influencing the gut health and the gut microbiome and vice versa. And all of them are being impacted by our psychoneuroimmunology. Now that's a 
a word that's going to win Scrabble, right? And what that means is basically how our thoughts affect our biology. And at the forefront of that is our neurological function and development and our immune system. Beautiful. So let's get into it. Let Tell me about how this how this works and let's get into some, you know, kind of once we talk about the science of how this all works, I would love to get into practical strategies of how to use this information to, to optimize energy levels. Absolutely. Absolutely. So first I want to talk about, and I know that you've been doing that as well. So I'm going to do a really brief hit on mitochondrial health and function and what that means and what our psycho neuroimmunology means, and then get into our gut microbiome and how they all intersect together to work together or to decrease function and health together. And absolutely, we'll get into the practical tips of what to avoid and what to do to boost the intersection of all three. Beautiful. Let's do it. Take it away. All right. So we're going to start with just a brief overview of our mitochondria. So our mitochondria are the powerhouses of our cells, right? They're creating all of our energy through ATP. Now, ATP is the currency that our cells use for energy. And remember that our cells make up our organs, make up our body systems, make up us, right? So they're crucial for everything. They're associated with every kind of health uh, related illness we see. You know, George Wallace has done some amazing research out there with mitochondrial health. And he's shown that any dip in the voltage of the mitochondria or the energy production can be associated with any kind of chronic disease, you know, obesity, um, cardiovascular disease, cancer, but it goes even further than that, right? It's been um, associated with mood disorders, anxiety, depression, behavioral issues in kids, neurological development. So mitochondria are really the foundation of our energy production, right? Every single day, we are making our body weight in ATP. I mean, they do not stop. So they're kind of our foundation for our energy production. And a lot of, when I graduated school 12 years ago, um, medical school, you know, a lot of the talk around mitochondria really focused on food. And that's true, but we've gone beyond that to realize that there's some really interesting things that our mitochondria do to harvest energy, one of them being um, structuring the water around the cell and the mitochondria. And that is where we really get that big burst of energy, right? So we'll get into that a little bit later when we talk about practical tips. But I just wanted to kind of highlight how our mitochondria aren't just using our food to create that ATP. They're also using our environment to create an ideal amount of energy. And it's really neat. We'll see in the practical tips, our mitochondria are really kind of pushing us to live in the world. But more about that later. When we look at mitochondria and we get into the different pathways, we can see how important our stress and our mindset are with our mitochondria. You know, um, when we look at the pathways for gluconeogenesis, for our fatty acid cycle, for our um, panogenic cycle and some of those anxiety modes that we're in, we can see how in tune our mitochondria are with our psychoneuroimmunology, right? So previously we've thought, myself included as a practitioner, you know, looking at supplements like ribose D and carnitine and taurine and uh, CoQ10, all these supplements are great for mitochondrial health, but when our mitochondria aren't in the right context, meaning when we aren't living a lifestyle that's conducive to energy production, then they don't stand a chance, right? And I've seen this time and time again with my patients, with myself, when we're doing targeted therapies to accelerate or enhance the energy production of the mitochondria, if that person isn't living the lifestyle that's conducive to energy production, the supplements don't really 
do what we want them to do. They, we don't see as much of an energy increase as we would um, if someone was in context with the world. Now we can, that will dive right into our psychoneuroimmunology. So we talked, I just talked a little bit about how some of those food supplements um, aren't going to really prime that ATP um, pump in or the chain in the mitochondria unless we are in the right context. So I'm going to talk about food, I'm going to talk about nature, and I'm going to talk about our psychoneuroimmunology system. And that big uh, lottery winning word really talks about how our vagus nerve and our thoughts really create a highway, so to speak, between our brain, between our mitochondria, between our gut microbiome, and thus gut health and our gut lining overall. So our psychoneuroimmunology is really kind of talking about the power that positive emotions have versus negative emotions, right? And of course, when I start to talk about that, I always like to say, as humans, we're really meant to vacillate between our emotions, right? And one of the amazing things that the field of psychoneuroimmunology has um, really kind of brought forth in the research is centering around heart rate variability, right? And so when we talk about the heart rate, that's um, measuring our beats per minute, right? Heart rate variability, on the other hand, is looking at the ability of the heart to go from one situation to another, right? So when we talk about our nervous system, there are three things we really need to talk about. We need to talk about the fight or flight system where, you know, you and I are talking right now and we're talking about one of my favorite topics. So I feel excited and relaxed and I'm in my rest and digest mode where we want to be. Now, if a bear jumps in the room, I'm going to dump all that adrenaline or adrenaline cortisol and really be in that hypervigilant uh, fight or flight mode right? And, and that's important. We're supposed to do that, get the blood to the extremities, and run away from the bear. And oftentimes in our modern day life, we're not uh, running away from the bear to the meadow and then getting that balance back. And that's what heart rate variability is really talking about. It's talking about being able to handle the stresses of everyday life and bounce back to a state of rest and rejuvenation that we see in the parasympathetic um, mode. Now, when we talk about the parasympathetic versus the sympathetic fight or flight, we're really talking about the vagus nerve, right? And it innervates the heart, and that innervation goes right up to the brain. It also innervates right into the gut microbiome. I mean, excuse me, the gut lining, right? Which is intimately tied with the gut microbiome. We used to think that these messages were metabolites, right? Me break down metabolites from digestion, um, metabolites, and messages from the heart about heart rate. But now we're really understanding that we do have that kind of messaging, right? It's kind of like um, snail mail, right? So you get those breakdown metabolites and they go through the circulation and get up to your brain. But what we now know from research is that the nerve innervates directly, directly into the heart directly into the enterocytes that line the gut microbiome. So this connection is way more profound than we have realized previously. Now, what does that mean as far as our psychoneuroimmune system and how our thoughts affect our biology? Well, um, Heart Math Institute has been doing some amazing research like for the last 25 years, and they have a whole slew of peer-reviewed great research out there talking about the connection between our conscious thoughts and our heart rate variability, right? So 
when we have a negative panic thought, right? That bear jumps in the room. Now, that's appropriate. There's a bear in the room. So we want to run away from the bear. We want to have that burst of cortisol, but we don't want to be stuck there. We want to get away from the bear, go to the meadow, chill out, have our berries, and go to that rest and digest phase. So what heart rate variability is doing is making sure that we get there, that we can flip and flop. We can be in that stressful zone and then flip back. And what we've seen from the research is that our thoughts are so powerful in this connection, right? So when we have that panic mode from the bear, it's important. But when we keep that panic mode or those negative thoughts, what they do is they actually sever the connection to our frontal lobe. Now, our frontal lobe is where we think rationally, we have compassion, we can take a second, take a deep breath and make the right decision. That um, communication highway is routed elsewhere because we're in our fight or flight. And that also impacts our gut microbiome. So when we see the effects of those kind of emotions on our gut microbiome, we can kind of see how the vagus nerve kind of really governs it all. And there's some really neat slides that show how our stress can really impact not only our inflammatory cascade, right, but our actual lining of the gut, right? So those consistent negative thoughts affect our neurology, right? So they're severing that uh, communication to the frontal lobe. So we can't be thinking rationally and calmly. They increase our inflammation and they're doing a doozy on the gut lining, right? Those inflammatory cytokines that increase after stress actually go in and cause a loosening of the tight junctions of the gut microbiome. So the tight junctions of the gut microbiome, the enterocytes that line the uh, wall of the gut are held together by tight junctions. And these are really neat. When we look at them under the microscope, they kind of look like zippers. And when we're talking about leaky gut or intestinal permeability, we're talking about um, not someone unzipping the zipper, right? We're talking about, it looks like uh, when you look at it under a microscope, like someone's pulling at the sides of the zipper and there's microscopic little holes that occur. And so microscopic amounts of whatever you're eating can get into the bloodstream and further increase inflammation. And we know inflammation causes all kinds of problems with our mitochondria. It decreases our energy production. It decreases the amount of mitochondria in the gut. So we're starting to see how they all intersect together. And it's so amazing, Ari. I just, it's so fascinating to see how thoughts of stress and negativity can instantly increase our inflammation. But on the flip side, we really have the power to do just the opposite. So like I was just talking about, um, the Heart Math Institute and some of the research that has come out around, um, heart rate variability and heart coherence, where we in a state of calm. And what do I mean by this? I'm not talking about um, being a meditation guru, you know, not being stressed. We all encounter stress, right? But at that moment, we have a pivotal decision to make. Do we hold on to those negative thoughts? How do we deal with that stress? And heart coherence is really the practice of taking five deep breaths. We do four counts in, eight counts out, and we think of something that brings us peace, calm, love. Um, maybe it's your favorite favorite place of vacation. Maybe it's a favorite childhood memory um, for myself personally. And Catherine, uh, can you guide yeah. us through this right now? Absolutely. Is, is that something maybe we can just take two minutes to, to practice this, like one quick go through it? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So let's first take a second to find something that brings us calm, brings us love, brings us joy. So whether that's a place, a memory, um, a loved one, for me, I envision my kids, you know how they give you a hug and they wrap their arms around your neck and they wrap their legs around your waist and they bury their head in just completely. So that is what um, I envision. I envision just that big unconditional hug from uh, one of my children. So we've all got that imagery, right? So let's close our eyes and we're going to take four deep seconds of inhale through our nose and then we're going to exhale through our mouth. So let's try that. One, two, three, in. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's try that again. In, one, two, three, four, and out. Five, six, seven, eight. Let's do it one more time and I'll breathe with you. One last time. So just in four or five breaths, we can completely change our biology. Isn't that amazing? We can change what our gut lining and our gut microbiome are doing. We can change how much energy our mitochondria are creating just by utilizing the power of our mind. Yeah, amazing. I, I wanna interject one thing here related to this, the flip side of it. Um, I interviewed a researcher, you, you mentioned Doug Wallace uh, earlier. I interviewed a researcher who's done some work with him on a field called mitochondrial psychobiology. His name is Dr. Martin Picard, and they've done several experiments where they've basically put subjects under stress and shown that literally within a matter of a couple minutes, they can find detectable amounts of mitochondrial DNA that has leaked into the bloodstream from this episode of psychological stress that happened minutes before. So in other words, there's a cascade of events happening at the cellular, at the mitochondrial level that's causing damage and that is leaking this mitochondrial DNA into the bloodstream where it should not be. Your mitochondria should be in your, in your mitochondria inside your cells, not floating around your bloodstream. And it's also been determined that those the mitochondrial DNA as well as uh, purinergic molecules, as uh, Dr. Robert Navio refers to them in the cell danger response, uh, ATP, ADP, those also leak into the bloodstream where they should not be. And these things basically serve as danger molecules. They communicate to other cells in the body that the body is under, under stress, under attack, is, is, needs to shift out of energy mode more into defense mode. So it's really the flip side of what you just guided us through. And I, I, I just want to basically point out to people that literally within a matter of seconds or a minute of a stressful event or a practice like the one that Dr. Clinton just guided us through, uh, you, you are changing your physiology in profound ways. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And that's really what the heart rate variability research shows as well, is that shift can be instantaneous and so profound. I mean, you talked about the inflammatory cascade that happens in the body and in the mitochondria, and it is, it's it's instantaneous and we, our bodies are so in tune with what's happening that oftentimes we don't even realize what's happening. You know, it's a little bit after the fact that we realize, you know, oh, I'm stressed out and there's this whole cascade going on, but it's so incredibly empowering, I think, for myself and my patients to know that there is a flip side to it. You know, you look at the research with chronic stress and trauma, and 
the latest research shows that 60% of us are dealing with some kind of trauma. And they define trauma as a loss of a loved one, bullying, um, you know, a loss of a house, financial loss, chronic stress in the workplace. I mean, I, I feel like 60% might be a little low. <laughs> and then, you know, and then when we look at what that's doing to the mitochondria and what that's doing to inflammation, we're seeing that an event like that in childhood or in, um, in early life can set you up with an inflammatory state that lasts a lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, your risk for autoimmunity and chronic disease skyrocket because you've laid the foundation for this inflammation. And what we're really starting to see from the research is that our mitochondria really have a huge piece in our resilience to stress as well, right? So that's, again, the flip side of that, is that if we are on top of our game physically, if we are tending to our gut health and we're tending to our mitochondrial health and we're tending to our thoughts, then we can really, really impact and be resilient against those stresses that we know are gonna come, right? Um, and, and when I say trauma, I think so many of us think of capital T trauma, right? Um, these big stories of, of death and loss and, and trauma and chronic stress don't have to take that uh, face. It can really come in, in the small T trauma that we face kind of day in and day out in our modern life and seeing how that sets up those uh, cytokines, those inflammatory cascades in our body where our, you know, our body's like a orchestra and everybody's working together to play the, the same song. And then the tuba starts playing a different song and everyone's like, what are we doing? What song are we playing? And, if, and that inflammatory cascade kind of um, chases its tail and um, increases. And I think it's just really important to recognize that you know, our, our stresses and our reactions to stresses can really set the stage of what our overall inflam inflammatory state is in the body. And we know that inflammation isn't good for so many reasons, right, chronically. So I think it's, it's really important for us to, to not only see how it is in the moment, how we can change our biology in the moment for the better or the worse, same thing, um, it's important to recognize as a lifestyle. This can really set us up for an inflammatory state to last years and years, a decades, a li an entire lifetime. And that's huge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So how does all of this information, we, you know, you've talked about this, the psychoneuroimmune element of this. Um, You've talked about the microbiome, the gut aspect of it, the gut permeability aspect with the tight junctions and how they are responding to stress. You've we've tied this into mitochondria. You've given this example of the the coherence method, this 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 practice that you just guided us through. Are there any other practical tips that we can leave people with? That you can leave people with uh, on how to apply this information to optimize all of these different systems and how they work together better to increase energy levels. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's get into the practical tips. But first, I want to just not leave out our superheroes of the immune system, those T reg cells, the T regulatory cells. And just to kind of lay the foundation for the practical tips, it's important for us to realize that um, our immune system is governed by a few different branches. We have the Th1 branch that increases inflammation in the face of infections. Um, and we have the Th2 branch that increases inflammation in response to parasites, uh, in response to allergies. We've got the Th17, which is really doing the uh, um, autoimmune 
reactions. And now our T regulatory cells are the cells that go in and put the damper on those. You know, they say, okay, the infection's gone. Let's decrease this inflammation. Let's stop all this inflammatory talk. We've dealt with the infection or the allergic event or whatever it may be, and now we need to decrease that inflammation. And the exciting thing about the Treg cells is that we can see that they immediately boost from this mindfulness. Now, we talked about heart coherence, and I led you through an exercise, but it's not the only one, right? There's all kinds of neurofeedback, cognitive behavioral therapies, um, emotional freedom tapping, tension releasing exercises, somatic education. And to be honest, there's a lot of good information and practical exercises on YouTube. Um, there's lots of great information like the exercise I led you through um, out there. So you can kind of pick and choose what um, technique works for you. But so let's get into these practical tips with those Treg cells in mind. Um, what we really want to do is we want to give our mitochondria, our gut microbiome, and our psychoneuroimmune system what it needs to be at its best, and we want to avoid what damages it, right? So a quick overview of what is going to damage our mitochondria, our processed foods with all the additives, we know that decreases mitochondrial function. We know that um, a lot of our pharmaceuticals out there, antibiotics, our NSAIDs and aspirins, our SSRIs, these medications are also uh, damaging the ATP production in mitochondria and decreasing the numbers of uh, mitochondria in the cell. You, we, there's a, you know, I want to mention something real quick on that. There's a, a website called MitoAction, uh, I believe MitoAction.org, and they've published a document with a list of uh, prescription and over-the-counter drugs that have known mitochondrial toxicity and that, that damage mitochondria. And it might be shocking for a lot of people listening to learn how many of the most common pharmaceuticals prescription and over-the-counter pharmaceuticals uh, are known to cause damage to mitochondria. Absolutely. It is shocking. And I'm hoping that the awareness that you are bringing to it, all the research that is coming out will help shift our thinking a little bit about how foundational our mitochondria are for health. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. So that's a great site to check out. Um, we also know that industrial chemicals, uh, pesticides, those also damage the mitochondria, as well as what we've been talking about with chronic stress, trauma, uh, negative thoughts. So those are some things that uh, you want to avoid and be mindful of when you're trying to create a life full of superhuman energy, right? You wanna be mindful of these things that will kind of tick down the function of those mitochondria. Now our circadian rhythm is another thing that has a big impact on our mitochondrial function, right? So those late nights in front of the computer, on our devices, on the phone, those are really gonna mess up our production of ATP. Um, you know, waking up and seeing that sunlight in the morning is such a prime booster to um, increase, again, the number of mitochondria in the cell and the production of ATP. And it's really interesting to see the connection between you know, that AM sun in the morning hitting our melanospin in the eyes and really going through, again, another biological cascade that leads us to more mitochondrial uh, production of energy, which is our goal, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about uh, the Treg cells and decreasing inflammation, now the Treg cells um, are really boosted with resistant starches. So resistant starches are things we find in asparagus, onions, fennel, garlic. Um, again, that's something you can Google and look up the resistant starch content of what you wanna eat. But those, if they're plant-based fiber foods and those fibers are not 
digested by our body. So they reach the colon undigested and the gut microbiome ferments them into short chain uh, fatty acids, right? One of those fatty acids being butyrate. So those resistant starches are fermented into short chain fatty acids like butyrate. When that happens, that triggers an increase in those T reg cells. Now, we talked a little bit about uh, trauma and stress decreasing uh, our, or I'm sorry, increasing our inflammation. It also decreases our T reg cells. You know, inversely, we see that inflammation go up with stress and we see our T reg cell go down. Our, you know, um, T reg cell counts go down. So um, this is a brilliant way to not only affect the mitochondrial health, the T reg health, which is helping with our immune system and inflammation and our mitochondrial health, and that butyrate that is produced by our gut microbiome is directly feeding, directly feeding the mitochondria of the gut, mm -hmm. which is just amazing, right? So um, a meal of asparagus is going to get you a ton of resistant starches, and those resistant starches are going to feed your uh, mitochondria. They're going to help the enterocytes that line the gut. They're going to increase that mucus layer that helps the um, gut microbiome, right? It kind of increases their real estate, so to speak. And it also... Um, makes us more resilient to the stresses of everyday life. Mm -hmm. And that's just amazing, just that in and of itself. Yeah, now, it. great stuff. Yeah. And we can see the same thing when we're looking at omega-3 fatty acids. So, you know, something I always say when I'm talking about mitochondrial health is they're really kind of pushing us, all the research and all these tips, they're really pushing us to live in the world that we evolved in, right? So we evolved eating these resistant starches and we evolved around waterways getting plenty of omega-3 fatty acids, right? And so those omega-3 fatty acids, when we look back at the, um, all those pathways into the mitochondria, we see that direct pathway of the fatty acids and how important omega-3s are to fuel the mitochondrial production of energy. We also see um, omega-3s uh, increasing the health and um, adherence of those tight junctions in the gut. And we also see omega-3 fatty acids increasing our resilience to stress. I, I can't, ah, it's just so fascinating and so awe-inspiring. The other day I read a study of breast cancer survivors that had less recurrence or less fear of the recurrence of breast cancer because they were on omega-3 fatty acids. And, you know, is it because we found the cure in omega-3s? No, not at all. It's because we um, evolved around waterways and that's what our body needs to um, be able to function at its best. So that is a really powerful tool. Resistant starches, omega-3 uh, fatty acids, antioxidants are doing the same thing. They are helping our gut microbiome. They are helping our gut lining. They are increasing our ATP production and our mitochondria. And they are increasing, again, that psychoneuroimmune system so that we have more resilience to uh, the stresses of everyday life. Let now, me, when we're uh, talking quick, about quick question, um, when you say antioxidants, yeah. what specifically are you referring to? Well, NAC is a big one, but um, I am specifically referring to the whole slew of them. <laughs> you know, uh, vitamin C, vitamin A, uh, vitamin E. There's a whole bunch, and then you know the whole umbrella of phytochemicals, the flavonoids and all of those things really um, impact our resistance to stress and our gut microbiome and our gut health. Now, when and, you're talking about like how they, they can modify the gut microbiome, are you, are you saying like isolated vitamin A or vitamin E uh, or vitamin C, um, 
you know, just those the pure forms of those vitamins taken as pills will modify our gut microbiome? Or are you saying more like in the natural food context, that that whole food is known to modify the gut microbiome? Yep, that second one. Okay. <laughs> that second one. Yep, the whole food form. Um, and again, all the research that I read with mitochondrial health really is just pointing us to how we should live in the world, right? Um, we need that movement and contact with the world. Um, Katie Bowman is just wonderful with her research about how you need to move, not in just, you know, you your jazz or size or your spin class or whatever it is. You need to get out in the world, climb over those boulders. Um, movement we see has a powerful um, effect on our mitochondria and our gut microbiome, right? The research out there shows that um, moderate exercise increases the beneficial strains in our gut microbiome and decreases the harmful ones, right? So that ratio is really benefited by, by movement. And the same thing with our mitochondria, right? Um, movement increases the production of ATP and it increases the amount of mitochondria that are in the cell. Now, the same thing that we talked about with mindfulness or meditation, um, that helps the gut microbiome. It helps, again, the gut lining through that inflammatory cascade. And it's um, increasing our ATP production and our, the number of mitochondria in the cell. Just from mindfulness, the practice of meditation, separate from what I was talking about um, with heart, heart coherence and the heart math. Mm. So that's really exciting news as well. And getting out in nature, um, like we talked about in the beginning, um, making sure our mitochondria are producing as much energy as they can requires us to live in the world. Um, it requires us to do the things that we evolved as humans doing, eating resistant starches, omega-3 fatty acids, eating, you know, a rainbow, so to speak. That's what I talk about with my patients a lot, eating lots of different plant foods and lots of different colors. Um, and the same thing goes with our lifestyle. We're meant to be outside. We're meant to be getting that full spectrum light from the sun. Now we know from the research that grounding on the earth, right? So that we're making contact with the electromagnetic field of the earth, structures our water in a way outside of the cells so that more ATP can be produced in that mitochondria. So getting out in nature, touching the ground, touching the trees, climbing on those boulders, hiking in the woods, all of that primes our mitochondria to make more energy. Mm -hmm. And it isn't, it isn't a bank, right? We talked about our mitochondria are making our body weight in ATP every single day. So it's not a bank. There's no place to put the ATP for later. It's a constant thing. And that's what our mitochondria are telling us. And that's what the research is telling us is that we constantly need to have contact with the outside world. We constantly need to be living in that circadian rhythm of the sun. Mm -hmm. We need to have that AM sunshine. We need to lower our lights and our devices at night so that melatonin can go up and we can get that sleep. Um, it's I love, really I want to just interject. I love how much you're yeah. emphasizing sunlight, circadian rhythms. Um, the sub I've I've written extensively and produced a lot of con content around circadian rhythms and all the mechanisms of how that ties into mitochondrial health. A lot of people don't know melatonin is probably the single most potent protector of the mitochondria, and that even just standard room lighting in your home is suppressing your melatonin by over fifty percent every night. So there's a, a huge tie-in between the simple thing that almost everyone's doing, which is just being indoors in a home under artificial light, looking at a TV or a computer or, or cell phone screen, massively suppressing every single night 
this key hormone that's involved in not just your sleep, but protecting directly protecting your mitochondria. Um, I also just quick side note, love how much you're emphasizing sunlight. It's the topic of my next book. And in that book, I'm presenting a huge amount of research and basically arguing that sunlight is as big of a factor in our health, health as nutrition, as exercise, as good sleep, and that it's probably the single most underrated uh, factor in, in good health that not, I think way too few people talk about. So I really appreciate you emphasizing that. Oh, I appreciate the work you're doing. I'm so excited for this book. Um, Absolutely. It is so underrated and so brushed under the rug, you know, sun, yeah, blah, but it's foundational. When you talk about melatonin, going out and getting that AM sun primes that melatonin dump at night. Yeah. And we think of that, you know, we think of that um, as being two separate things, you know, at night, melatonin happens. Well, yeah, but you're production and your dumping of melatonin happens with that AM sun. It's critical. And all those things that you mentioned can be boiled down to whether or not you're getting that sun. So absolutely. I'm so glad that, that you're talking about that. We need everybody talking about that. Um, Yeah. uh, And, and, and also going outside, getting that sunshine and experiencing the weather, mm-hmm. right? So if it's cold and if it's winter, we're still supposed to go outside and we're supposed to be cold, yeah. you know? And I don't mean it in a, I feel like with podcasts and being uh, on social media that I need to say, I don't mean frostbite and some mm-hmm. weird thing. I mean, feel cold in the winter feeling that cold will increase again that ATP production in the mitochondria and the amount of mitochondria in the cells. Mm -hmm. Um, And the same goes for saunas and being hot in the summer. I mean, it really, I think it's fascinating how the mitochondrial research points at us needing to be humans to be healthy. And needing needing to align (laughs) with nature and our sort of ancestral way of life. Yes, where we fit in, in the context of this ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. Um, We are a part, just like our gut microbiome is an ecosystem, right? Same thing with, you just take that, what we see on a micro level, we see on a macro level. And everything we're talking about here is really how our ecosystem works. Mm -hmm. Um, we are centered around the sun. We live in an atmosphere. And so as humans, we should be getting sunshine. We should be getting out in the snow. I mean, that's one of the main things when I talk about mitochondrial health and getting outside and people say, oh, it's winter time. And it's like, yep. So go outside and get a little cold and that will help your energy production and that will help your mitochondrial health. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Clinton, this has been awesome. I'm wondering if you could wrap up with sort of the top, I don't know, three or four things that you want to leave people with, key takeaways from your talk. Well, I think the first key thing is recognizing how interconnected everything is, how our vagus nerve and our neurology and our thoughts really influence not only our gut health, but the gut microbiome, the little critters that are living in us, and our mitochondrial health, um, it's all so interconnected. And because it's so interconnected, um, the second thing I hope people would take away is that it's not just a one-shot, take your CoQ10 or your D-ribose supplement and you're good. Um, Because it's so interconnected, mitochondrial health is also interconnected. We need that sunshine. We need grounding and contact with the earth. We need water, uh, clean water. We need um, to be out in the weather and feel the whatever's out there, right? If it's winter, we need to be feeling the cold. If it's summer, we need to be feeling the heat. And that's really where true health comes is through those connections and our connection with our greater world 
Beautifully said. Dr. Clinton, thank you so much uh, for sharing your wisdom with all of our listeners. Uh, I, I want to ask you if somebody's interested in connecting with you, working with you, following your work, where's the best place to get in contact with you? Well, I'm very active on social media because I love that um, connection, immediate connection and conversation we can have. So you can find me at Dr. Catherine Clinton on Instagram or Facebook. And my website is wellfuture.com. And that's where I have my blog and talk about all these things. Beautiful. Dr. Clinton, thank you so much. Really such a pleasure to have you. This was a very, very fun, very informative talk. I'm sure everybody listening loved it. To everybody listening, I will see you in the next interview. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next